Thank you, Phyllis Jones. Good morning and welcome to worship at First United Methodist Church of Lexington. If you're joining us for the first time or a member, we will remind you that a bulletin for today's service can be found on our website. And I'd like to also remind our members that our, our bulletin and the announcements that we're going to share this morning are also on the weekly email that Donna sends out on Friday. And all of the information that we'll be sharing as announcements are on there, plus more detailed information. But also for our members, we would like to remind you that that weekly email goes out on Fridays. And if you are not getting that, we may need to update your email address or it could be found in maybe your spam folder because it's sent out to so many folks. You are welcome to call the office and we'll help to uh, figure out a way to make sure that that's getting to you and that you can find that every Friday afternoon. So we're continuing to communicate with you with our regular mailings to those that do not have computer access. Uh, we're also using our phone tree, emails, and of course our website, YouTube, and Facebook so we try as many different ways as we can to communicate with you and share with you not only our services, but also all the other events that are going on at our church during the course of a week. And in those announcements, let me share a couple of those before we begin our worship service today. We have five adult Sunday school classes that are meeting via Zoom, and they are set up and waiting for you. You'll find that on that email, or you can find that on our website. You're encouraged to attend one of those classes if you are already not a part of that. A directory is provided in that email, as we taught, mentioned on Friday afternoons. You can review the class description, choose one of those that you would like to attend. Then, of course, click the blue Zoom link that is provided there. Zoom instructions with screenshots can be provided from our church office if you would like to have that. And Donna will be glad to share that with you. We'd also like to tell you that this coming Sunday, which would be October the 4th, it will be also World Communion, but we're also planning to meet outside for the first time on a Sunday morning since March. And we'd like to make that at 9 o'clock and remind you that at 8.30, if it is raining, we will be moving the recording of the service inside, but we will not be bringing in our congregational members. More information and detailed information about that is in our reminder. It's in this bulletin, and of course, it is also on our website. Also, like to remind you that this coming Wednesday night, our prayer service will be at 6 p.m. instead of 7 p.m. That's this coming Wednesday night. Our prayer service will be at 6 p.m., located outside between our church and the Presbyterian Church. Also, the sympathy of our ministers and the members of our congregation here at First Methodist are extended to the family of Albert Gobble upon his death on September the 22nd, 2020. More information of that has been sent out by email from our church office. If you missed that, please call and we'll be glad to share information about the details or arrangements for his funeral. And all other announcements, again, we'll remind you, are in our bulletin or located on our website. And now we'd like for you to turn with us to your bulletin as we begin our worship service. We're going to begin with a call to worship, and we ask that you read responsively with us, not only here in the, in the church, but also at home. Give ear to God's teaching. We ask you to hear the story of our Incline your ears to parables and dark sayings of old. Tell the coming generations of God's glorious deeds. We will not hide them from our children. Come to the fount of living water. We will drink deeply from the waters of life. Taste the wellspring of our salvation. We gather to worship as people reborn. And as we gather to worship, we'd like to echo those ideas in our first hymn, which is hymn number 400, and remind you that the the words for this hymn are in your bulletin. Thank you. 
And as we gather this day for worship, we gather to open our hearts and minds to God in prayer as well. And now, may we take a moment to go to God in prayer. May we pray. Eternal and loving God, we gather in your presence this morning. Even though we may be separated by the miles, we are joined through the wonders of technology. But most importantly, we are joined together through the power of your Holy Spirit that calls us, leads us, and connects us with you, with one another, and with your creation. And we gather this day through the grace of your Son who walked this earth, lived our lives, died our death, and yet rose again to bring us closer in connection with you. This day we thank you, Lord, that you have created us in your image, male and female. You have created us, all of us. And may we recognize the reflection of your image upon the faces of our brothers and sisters and neighbors and friends and people around town and people around the world. For it is when we look at humanity as a whole, we begin to see the reflection of your face. This day, Lord, there are many ways in which your image is broken through our actions, through the ways that we refuse to see your image on the face of others around us, for the ways in which we call one another out and are divided for many different reasons. Lord, help us heal those barriers. Help us tear down the walls that separate us one from another. Give us ears to hear the stories of our neighbors and eyes to see the pain on our neighbors' faces. Give us hands and feet to offer a hand up. And at the same time, Lord, when we are hurting, when we are suffering, when we are struggling, rather than closing in upon ourselves, help us find ways to open our hearts to others and place people in our lives to help lift us up as we so need it. For this day, Lord, as we celebrate your creation, we celebrate your presence, we ask for your forgiveness. And even as we ask for forgiveness, we pray that you would help us forgive others so that we may be reconciled in you. And as we seek forgiveness, Lord, help us this day to see where our actions have caused pain, have caused hurt. Transform us so that we may be relationship builders instead of breakers. This day, Lord, there are many people within our community, our church, our friends, our families, who are hurting, who are suffering, whether it be through loss or illness or struggles at work or struggles at home. Lord, walk with us through those struggles. We know that you know our struggles because you walked with us, because you lived our lives, because you faced what we face. Give us the strength, the grace, the patience, the peace, the wisdom of Jesus to live the lives that we need to serve you in all that we say and all that we do. And now, Lord, as we close our prayers, pull us together, one congregation, one heart, one voice, as we pray together the prayer that our Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And this day as we gather, as we do every week in worship, as we gather both live and online, we gather for prayer, we gather for praise, we gather for learning, we gather for spiritual growth, and we gather to be transformed. We also gather to offer our prayers, our presence, our gifts, and our service, and our witness to God and to God's church. And today, as we talk about our offering, I want to thank you all for all the ways that you continue to support First United Methodist Church. It's your prayers that keep the church connected in this time of social distancing. It's your presence, both live and online, that gives the church to the hope to keep moving forward together. And it's your gifts that give the ministry of the church the resources to touch people with the love of Christ, even in times like this. 
And finally, it's your service and your witness that shares the good news of God's love, mercy, and grace to a hurting and a broken world. So today, thank you for your loving support for First United Methodist Church. And if you are a guest worshiping with us from another church, I encourage you to support your church with your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness. And now would you join with me as we pray together our prayer of thanksgiving. O oh God, use these gifts to do your will in the world and prepare us for your coming kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Have you ever gone to write something and started your schoolwork and your pencil lead breaks or your pencil may not be sharpened? Luckily for us, to sharpen a pencil is pretty simple if you have the right tools. Once our pencil is sharpened, we can do so much with it, like writing and drawing, filling in the bubbles on a test. God wants us to use wants to use us in all sorts of wonderful ways to serve him and his people. But we must be sharpened first for his purposes. Well, how does that happen? Well, most importantly, we can sharpen ourselves by reading the Bible and the power of prayer. Once we develop our faith and trust in God, he can use us to do remarkable things. It would be silly to sharpen a pencil and set it aside. But when we use it, the purpose of the lead is fulfilled. Once it is sharpened, will it stay that way forever? Of course not. Eventually, the point will dull or the tip might even break. We need to continue sharpening a pencil in order to keep using it. In the same way, we must continually return to the Bible and to prayer so that we can remain sharp and usable as Christians. We keep close to God by loving him and communicating through him, reading his words and talking to him in prayer. And we also love his children as Jesus instructed. Christ here promises that God will keep us close if we remain near to him. When we do this, we can rest assured that we will stay sharp because without God, life is like an unsharpened pencil. It just has no point. Amen. Bonnie the Messiah
Thank you so much, Asher. That was beautiful. This morning we continue our gospel readings in Matthew, the 21st chapter. And today we begin at verse 23. Hear now the words of our Lord. When Jesus entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him as he was teaching and said, By what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? Jesus said to them, I will also ask you one question. If you tell me the answer, then I will also tell you by what authority I do these things. Did the baptism of John come from heaven or was it of human origin? And they argued with one another. If we say from heaven, he will say to us, why then did you not believe him? But if we say of human origin, we are afraid of the crowd, for all regard John as a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we do not know. And he said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. What do you think? A man had two sons. He went to the first and said, son, go and work in the vineyard today. He answered, I will not. But later he changed his mind and went. The father went to the second and said the same. And he answered, I go, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? They said, the first. Jesus said to them, truly I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are going into the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. And even after you saw it, you did not change your minds and believe him. The word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Holy and blessed God, we gather in your presence this morning as your children, seeking your words of wisdom. Lord, as we come, open our hearts and our minds to hear these words today and to learn what you would have us glean from them. We pray this in Jesus, your son's name. Amen. Our scripture this morning is about a question of authority. We want to know in whom and what to place our trust to find the source of truth about the world in which we live. As children, our first source of authority is usually our parents. They are the source of all that we know about the world around us, the ones that keep us warm and fed and safe, the ones who will come when we cry. They're willing and able to meet our needs, answer our questions, and keep the chaos of life at bay as we learn and grow and become people of the world. As we get older, our sources of authority rightly expand. We learn from teachers at school and at church, from members of our extended family, from friends and their families, from politicians and government officials, from the media and the marketplace. Want to know what the Bible is all about? You can ask your pastor. Wondering how the force of gravity works? Your physics teacher knows. Wondering about your great aunt who never got married and can't understand why? Her sister could tell you the story. Can't decide who to vote for. Political ads right now are everywhere. Pondering a new car? Consumer Reports breaks down the pros and cons of all the latest models. 
Every day we find ourselves bombarded by a multitude of so-called authorities. But how do we know which ones are reliable and true? In this morning's passage from Matthew, the chief priests and elders have questions as well. Questions about Jesus' authority as a teacher, a prophet, and a leader. The confrontation takes place in the Jerusalem temple the day after Jesus rides into the city on a donkey, surrounded by cheering crowds. Once inside the city gates, Jesus went immediately for the temple, the center of Jewish religious life, and he overturned the tables of the money changers. Still rattled by these events the previous day, the Jewish leaders ask him, By what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? These are very reasonable questions for them to ask. I know that when you found out I was coming to be your pastor, you probably asked some similar questions about me. You wanted to know what my qualifications were, where I went to seminary, had I been ordained in the United Methodist Church, How long had I been a pastor? We naturally want to know where our leaders get their knowledge and what their qualifications are. And if they don't meet muster, it's hard for us to follow them. It was the same for the leaders in Jerusalem. They wanted to know exactly where Jesus' authority came from, especially because he was challenging their own authority. Jesus' response to their questions is to ask them a question back. Don't you just love it when people do that? He asks them, did the baptism of John come from heaven or was it of human origin? They argue with one another knowing that either way they'll be in trouble. If they say from heaven, Jesus will ask them why they didn't believe John's prophecy about him. But if they say from human origin, They know that the people will be upset with them because they saw John as a prophet whose words come from God. So they take the easy way out and simply say, well, we don't know. To which Jesus responds, neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. Their refusal to answer Jesus' question allows him to do the same. Why all this fuss about Jesus teaching and healing and preaching? Elsewhere in the Gospels, he has the audacity to say that his authority comes directly from the Father, but he doesn't stop there. He claims that he is the Son of God, even more that he and the Father are one, absolute blasphemy in the eyes of the temple officials. He is claiming to be a God. Of course, we know that he is God, not just fully human, but fully divine as well. His authority comes directly from God because he is God. They're one and the same. And the people who saw him speak knew that authority just came naturally out of him. They could tell something special was happening in their midst. You would think that this would make all of us sit up and pay attention. Whatever Jesus says in the scriptures, you know those red letters some of you have in your Bible, the words of Jesus. Whatever Jesus is saying in the scriptures, God is saying. Whatever Jesus is doing in the scriptures, God is doing. When Jesus tells us that we are to love our neighbors, forgive 70 times 7, take care of the poor and disadvantaged, seek justice for those who are mistreated, pray for our enemies, then we should take notice because God is telling us to do those things. Jesus' words made the Jewish leaders uncomfortable because they turned common wisdom upside down. Jesus asked about John the Baptist because he shares John's conviction that the children of God are not necessarily those who are born into the right family, 
or running in the right circles. Which is why he tells the parable about the two brothers. One who at first says he won't help his father in the vineyard, but later changes his mind and does. The other who readily agrees to help, but then doesn't. Which one of them did the will of the father? The temple leaders rightly say it's the son who at first refuses, but then changes his mind. True righteousness is in the doing rather than in the saying. You've heard that expression that we need to walk the talk. That's what Jesus is saying about these brothers. What good does it do to say that you will do your father's will, but then not do it? Jesus is suggesting that this is exactly what the chief priests and elders are doing. They are quick to say they will do their heavenly father's will, but then in the long run, they do not. Instead, those who at first go astray, but then have a change of heart, like the tax collectors and the prostitutes, they are the ones who will be welcomed into the kingdom of heaven. Truly, I tell you, The tax collectors and the prostitutes are going into the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. And even after you saw it, you did not change your mind and believe in him. Jesus knows that it's hard when we have our minds set a certain way to turn and go in another direction when God is calling us. The purpose of the parable is to make the hearers question their own claims to righteousness, their own source of authority. Are we living lives of integrity, matching our actions to our words? Or are we living by our own authority, giving lip service to God, but living our own carefully curated version? of the gospel. Where do we seek authority? Is it in the worldly ways of degrees and status and wealth and power? Or is it in the heavenly ways of Jesus? Is it in amassing wealth and influence in the kingdom of earth? Or is it in the humble yet powerful ways of Jesus Christ in the kingdom of heaven? Every generation has answered the question, where do we find our true authority in a different way? In Jesus' day, the authority was with the scribes, Pharisees, and temple leaders. They decided which rules to follow, which in turn determined who was in and who was out, who was righteous and who was unrighteous. That's why Jesus' declaration about tax collectors and prostitutes was so alarming. They were the ones who were supposed to be out. When Jesus came along, he turned the world upside down, leading to the founding of the Christian church. The early church and the apostles would be the source of authority for almost 500 years. When Christianity became the official religion of the Roman Empire, and when that empire eventually collapsed, authority shifted to the monastic movement that arose in response to the empire's corruption. For the next 500 years, these monastic communities would keep the scriptures and the traditions of the church alive. Then around the year 1000, the Christian world split into East and West, Orthodox. And Catholic. The Pope in Rome became the ultimate authority for the Western world until corruption raised its head again, church and empire once again entwined, and the Protestant Reformation began around 1500 AD. Sola Scriptura, Scripture alone, became our sole source of authority until we began to argue about how the scriptures should be read and interpreted. The Enlightenment brought science and historical criticism. The fundamentalist movement countered with their literal interpretations, which brings us up to the present day. Several years ago, Kirk and I went to a conference where we heard Phyllis Tickle, an imaginative Christian scholar and writer, 
who looked at this historical pattern of authority, how it went back and forth, and saw the chaos around us right now as signs of the latest transition in authority. What is the reason the church as a whole is losing members? The reason there is such polarization in our communities, our country, and our world? We are once again at a transition point. A time when one source of authority is waning and another is coming to take its place. What is this new source of authority? According to Phyllis Tickle, it's once again all about the Holy Spirit. In what is being called the dawning age of the Spirit, God will once again speak to us mainly through the Spirit's voice, helping us define our communities, hear God's voice through the scriptures, and discern God's call on our lives. Tickle points to the rapid expansion of the Pentecostal tradition as evidence. While most of our traditional Christian denominations are shrinking, the Pentecostal movement is taking off. Worldwide, there are more Pentecostals than any other denominational family. What sets Pentecostalism apart? It focuses on the movement of the Holy Spirit. Both Kirk and I have experienced this movement of spirit. Kirk in Bolivia and me in Kenya The Methodist churches in both of those countries have a spirit-filled nature with worship full of singing, dancing, clapping, and praying. People in both places rely on the movement of the spirit to sustain and lead them through difficult times, ecological challenge, and political unrest. You could feel the presence of the spirit in their midst in ways neither of us had ever experienced before. I can hardly describe it. It was palpable in the spaces where we worshiped and in the joy on the people's faces. You could feel the presence of the Spirit. And now, rather than the U.S. primarily sending missionaries overseas to them, they are actually beginning to send their own missionaries to the United States to remind us of our spirit-filled origins on that long-ago day of Pentecost, the beginning of it all. Jesus came to shake up the religious worldview of the Jewish people, to show them what it means to really live as a child of God. The apostles in the early church carried that vision forward. The monastic movement kept that vision alive during a dark period in history. The split between Orthodox and Catholics set our course in the Western world. The Protestant Reformation sought to correct corruptions, and Methodism's founder, John Wesley, sought to reignite the Holy Spirit in the Anglican Church. What do we need to keep that spirit alive and well in our own churches today? Perhaps it's time to read the words of Jesus with fresh, spirit-filled eyes, to be the son who, even though he at first says, no, I won't, comes to God's vineyard anyway, ready to embrace the work that is waiting for him, ready to say yes to whatever new thing God is doing, ready to reclaim God's authority for a new time and a new place. The chaos is swirling. God is trying to get our attention in the midst of pandemic and political corruption, divisiveness and inequality, self-centeredness and ecological disaster. The time has come for new wineskins. The authority of God's spirit is in the wind, blowing through our opened windows, our church courtyards, our community squares. What is our source of authority? The ever-present Spirit of God still in our midst. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. In response to this word, I invite you to stand and affirm your faith 
with the scriptures from Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. Let us declare our faith. If then there is any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing in the Spirit, any compassion and sympathy, make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Let the same mind be in us that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Receive now this blessing. As you go from this place, remember the Holy Spirit surrounds you wherever you go. The authority of that Spirit of Jesus, the Son of God the Father, goes with you, informs you, leads you, calls you. So as you go from this place, as you go from your homes, take that Spirit with you and know that God is asking you into the vineyard anew. Go now in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.